You are listening to The Real Faith Stories Podcast. Interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guest and hear their story. Elijah, welcome to Real Faith Stories. So good to have you on the program today. Thank you for having me on. I am very excited to introduce to our listeners your documentary called Send Proof. And we'll dig into why it's called that and what it's about. But first, I would like to hear about your backstory, how you came to faith, and then circle into the six-year process you went through to build this documentary. Yeah, so I grew up in a Christian home, went to church all the time. My grandfather was an elder. My mom taught Bible school, vacation Bible school, but she was very abusive and that caused me to question God's existence. Mm. I would be beat and just ask God, if you're real, why doesn't this stop? So about middle school years, I began to pray, God, if you're real, show me in a way that I know that I know. And this is because I I knew two paths were behind before me. Either I would party and do the teenage thing or give my life to Christ. And it depends on if God's real or not, which one makes sense. Yeah. And so I prayed that at the end of a church camp and then found myself at the same church camp the next year. So I told God, I've got to figure this out quick. I said, I will read my Bible through from beginning to end. And this was 13, 14 not having any clue of how thick that book was. <laughs> um, and so I'm reading through it and I get to the part where Moses is taken up into heaven and I feel a voice in my spirit say, if you don't give your life to me, you'll miss out on your promised land. I recalled the come to Jesus talks that I had as a child and I just begin to feel the holiness of God in a very powerful way, in, in a way that I just knew it was almost too much. I, I was like, God, you've got to stop this. And so I mm-hmm. gave my life to Jesus, and I felt peace after that. And that's how I became a Christian. So you were 13 to 14 in that age range at that yeah, time. Yeah. And it came through yeah. reading the Word. Yeah, and it came through encounter. Like, that powerful conviction of his holiness. Like I, I, I was telling the Lord, like, you've got to stop or this will kill me. It was that intense. Wow. How real, man. Yeah. So after that happened, what occurred in your life? How'd the trajectory change for you? I tried to follow Jesus as much as I could. And I went to college. I studied philosophy and psychology because I thought I wanted to be a pastor and go to seminary, I began experiencing a lot of doubt. And at the time, I thought it was intellectual doubt about the faith, but it was actually emotional doubt, is that sometimes trauma can bring up reoccurring things that need to heal. But I didn't have a grid for that. And I started seeking miracles. So I went to a vineyard church to see if miracles are real, thinking this is an intellectual doubt problem. Mm. And so if I saw miracles, my doubts in God would go away. And so I went there and I started seeing people pray for the sick and I started seeing them healed. And that really excited me. I ended up becoming a staff pastor in the vineyard and I, I, I served in the vineyard movement for about seven years. That's very interesting. The emotional doubt you said, versus the intellectual doubt. Explain the difference between the two, if you would, please. So let's say you have good questions about the Bible. The what about evolution or what about Noah's Ark or did Jesus really rise again? If you're provided with sufficient information that is good evidence, those doubts should go away. Hmm. And that would be an intellectual doubt. An emotional doubt is what happens when you know the truth is true, but you just can't force yourself to live it, or you live in fear it's not true. And so for me, when my mom would beat me and I would ask God, where are you? 
why are you not there? It's like a part of my heart froze in time. And so I would have that feeling randomly when bad things would happen. How'd you work through that? Oddly enough, it was dealing with my intellectual doubt and looking at the resurrection and studying that as apologetic made me go, I don't have questions anymore about this. Like I have looked at this through every angle. There's got to be something else going on. And so that took me into therapy and stuff like that. When you came to this revelation that it was emotional doubt that you were experiencing and not the intellectual, because you had covered the bases, as you said, what started to transition in your life as you started to deal with that head on and you could actually Mm -hmm. see it for what it was? I realized my feelings weren't telling me the truth and I could live like the truth was true and wait for my feelings to catch up a bit. That's powerful. And so, yeah, and I would take risk and see the kingdom come in power and the whole time, like, just be terrified as I did it. And so I would see crazy healings and then the next week be praying for people and be back in the same emotional state as I was with fear And I just realized how illusionary fear is. I would be willing to bet that everyone listening to this has experienced that exact same cycle. Sure. You made a decision, it sounds like. You just made a choice, right? Yeah. And I think as business owners, you have to do this all the time, is that you'll read a principle in a business book or or something of that nature. And you go, my logical mind tells me It's more probable than not this will work out for me, but I'm terrified of having to talk to people or go through the relationship stuff. And so we get stuck. And I see a lot of leaders and business owners ailing because they can't tell the difference between intellectual and emotional doubt. How do you discern that difference? First of all, There's no such thing as certainty in most things. Like there's very few things you can be 100% certain of. Two plus two is four or I exist is about the limits of that. Beyond that, you have to go, what do you think is most probably the case and live with the consequences? And if you start moving your life toward that trajectory and living like what you think is most probably the case, you usually see positive results with that. And I think sometimes we as leaders want to be more certain than life allows for. And so it works in the faith world. It works in the business world. It works in relationships. But you have to go, all right, now that I'm convinced this is most probably the case, my emotions aren't going to agree with me. And I think the benefit, you know, God works all things for the good of going through abuse and developing PTSD is I realized very early on there's a part of my emotions I should listen to and there's a part I shouldn't trust or I would just go into a downward spiral of depression. Being able to ferret out those emotions you listen to and those you don't, Mm -hmm. how does one go about doing that and understanding the difference between those two? I think emotions are good alarms. And I think they can tell you what you want or things you're not recognizing. And so it's helpful to journal and and to learn what my emotions are trying to communicate. So I listen to them, but they don't drive me. Mm. I filter them through, well, this is what scripture says. This is what wisdom says. And and in business world, wisdom is very important. And scripture is always telling us seek wisdom worth more than rubies. And so I I listen to my emotions at first and then I make the best decision I can. And I think that's how you listen to the Holy Spirit. I don't shut my brain off when I listen to the Holy Spirit. In fact, he speaks to my mind. I I, I ask him questions and He doesn't speak propositionally. Sometimes he'll speak in pictures. I always go, well, you're God. And logically, it's the case. Nothing's impossible for you. And so I will step into this. And it's worth taking the risk because I I value you maximally. And I want to know you in this lifetime. There's two things that you said. One was 
fear is essentially, you learned, an illusion. And, yeah. s- and secondly, we want to be more certain than life allows for. That is a brilliant statement. It's so true. We so want certainty. And I think those two statements really dovetail with one another. Yeah. With respect to fear, when you began to realize it was primarily an illusion, what did that do inside of you in terms of your ability to take steps forward? I realized the importance of character, that this is the ultimate thing God's trying to form in our lives is Mm -hmm. to be people of courage and integrity. And we hear stories as young people about great people of character, and we don't realize the pressure they're under. But in the end, you want to be able to stand before God and say, I was a person of character and I didn't compromise. Roland Baker's famous for saying this, like it testifies before the angels and the spiritual world that we love Jesus more than anything else. And I want to love him like that. So if if I'm listening to this internal fear all the time, I am not growing into who God wants me to be. There's this Bible verse that says, love must be sincere, love what is good, hate what is evil. And so to love God, I have to hate fear. I have to hate not feeling fear, but letting it control me so that I make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. That scripture in that context is, um, man, it's like a rock you can anchor yourself to, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, let's shift a little bit here and talk about how you moved into this whole idea of creating a movie called Send Proof. Okay. So what happened was while I was in the vineyard, I felt called to go to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And I went out there. And during that process, I find out that the senior pastor I served under said, there's no God, there's no miracles, and there's no evidence for this. He started reading like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. And I thought, well, I go to a church where people claim to be healed all the time. And I was interested in just gathering medical records together and start researching that. I had no idea how tremendous a task this was. And at the same time, I was praying like, God, I want to be a catalyst for the next great awakening. I want to see your kingdom come and transform our nation. Can you give me a strategy? And I thought about making a documentary. It's so far out of my field. I didn't have a background in business. I didn't have one in filmmaking. But I felt if I could make a documentary about miracles with medical evidence, it would transform our culture at some level. And so I began asking people who had had miracles occur, send in their medical evidence. And nothing really happened. And then one day I was at my house and I get a text from my friends that a prophetic minister at Bethel had called my name out at church. It was like the middle of the week on a Tuesday. And so I drive to the church and he tells me a lot of information about myself, that I grew up in Georgia, that he told me my birth date, he told me my wife's name, and he's like, God's commissioned you, go make the film. Did this individual know you at all, Elijah? No, he didn't know me at all. And I didn't know him at the time. And so as he's giving this information, I start thinking, well, maybe some of this is on Facebook. And and, and it's true, some of it was. But then he started giving me information that I'm like, there's no way you could research this. (laughs) And so it propelled me forward to start taking this seriously, like, My life has just changed, and I've got a new career that God's called me into. And so I find out about the Global Medical Research Institute. They're a group of people who research miracles. And then I start studying how to do a Kickstarter. We raise a lot of money on Kickstarter. And then I have to learn how to build a film company, how to hire people, and all of that stuff and start booking people to get filmed. And it's been an incredible journey. Unbelievable. What a, what a monumental task. It was. Yes. Well, let's talk about this. I think you said it took six years to finally create 
the documentary. Now, during that six-year period, it's like you're building the plane as you're flying it, right? It is, definitely. Share a couple experiences where you felt like you hit the wall and there, mm -hmm. there was no way you could move forward, but God showed up again. I think there's several very monumental experiences. The first was I realized how particular the case needed to be. A lot of miracles that happen, if you would have to, in order to prove that a miracle occurred, maybe do a test before the miracle began. Mm -hmm. That would be totally different than what a doctor would do in the normal course of events. I recorded a few cases that fell apart, and I thought, oh, no, this is going to be a disaster. We ran out of money at one point, and I was putting tons of money on credit cards, and eventually we nearly emptied our retirement savings of $175,000. Mm. Like film is not cheap. And then God gave us an investor. And each stage is this new learning curve where as a leader, you're trying to go, what parts of this do I need to learn in order to do quality control, but not get too much into the details and I, I would miss those things. Sometimes I would spend months trying to learn something and be like, oh, I could have just hired this out. Whereas I would not spend a lot of time on another project and go, oh, man, I was not able to hire well because I didn't know how to recognize skill. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was definitely a learning curve. And then we got to legal which is the thing you have to do in order to get insurance on the film. And I thought insurance is super important because we're claiming people are con artists in this film. Th there's just a long story about how film and legal works. And I realized we've used 160 clips from other movies, which is fair use and that's fine, but you have to document every one. And I'm like, we haven't documented any of our clips in five years. Oh man. And so, so yeah, it, it, it was a super learning curve. One of the giant experiences here was running out of money, obviously virtually running sure. out. And then you had an investor come on board with respect to that period of time. How did they connect with you? Did they hear about what you were doing? Or did you directly ask them? How'd that happen? Well, this gentleman heard about me. I was on a podcast talking about something entirely different, and there was just a reference to the movie, and we connected, and he, he took a big interest in the film. I love it. Yeah. God brought the right person at the right time, and it doesn't feel like the right time at all. It feels like this should have been done three or four years ago, Jesus. <laughs> no doubt. But during this time, I'm dealing with PTSD stuff. And it's where I'm learning, oh, I've got to deal with my fear or I, I will make things crash. And so I think as leaders grow and learn to deal with fear things and rejection, we shorten the time span between launching something and seeing it done. And I, I think that's so important as a leader is to realize your emotional growth will affect the outcome of your business more than anything else. You hear all these cookie cutter solutions. You've got person mm -hmm. A did this, person B did this, and then they got this end result. Well, the missing component I think you're touching on here, this is something I don't hear anyone talking about, or if they do, it's rare, is that whole emotional component here that allows you to move faster from point A to point B by overcoming the fear that's naturally going to occur, right? Right. Explain another situation that happened, Elijah, where, again, you hit a wall and you were about to throw your hands up and say, what have I done here? I'm done. I'm finished. Another situation, I would say bad hires. I, I think what we don't realize sometimes is if you let a bi bad hire stay on too long, they can sabotage your project. 
And what you think is you're just paying this person. And once you end the relationship, it's done. But then there's the cost of bringing someone else on, training them, and then having to adapt somewhat to that new person. And that can cost ten or $20,000 quick mm-hmm. that you didn't budget for. And there's the emotional stress. I think I had one bad hire that did some gossip afterwards and sabotaged the project a bit. And so, yeah, I, I think there's always this spiritual component in hiring of not being codependent, of trying to be honest, but understanding what type of relationship you have. Because oftentimes for me, when I hire people, it's easy to become friends and you stop making good decisions at that point. Explain to the listeners what this movie is about. This movie is my story of wrestling with miracles to go look for legitimate cases of miracles where the person has medical records before and afterwards, and they were healed of something. And GMRI researches these cases and gets them placed in peer-reviewed medical journals. So these are like the highest standard cases of medical professionals saying there's no known naturalistic explanation for this. Mm. When it comes to science, you can't call something a miracle, but you can say, We have looked at every way you can think about this, and we can't explain this in a naturalistic way. And so that's what they they wanted to set the bar at, and I think they accomplished that. The web address is sendproof.com. This is where people can grab the documentary, right? Yeah. Okay. What was the release date? September. Okay, September of 2021. What type of feedback have you been getting? I'm curious. I've gotten phenomenal feedback on it. I cannot think of anyone who's directly came with a negative comment. Most people are saying, I I have wanted something like this my entire life. I grew up in charismaticism or Pentecostalism, and I had these questions, and no one researched this stuff, and it, and I'm so glad you did it. Other people are saying, like, I'm just crying and it's built my faith because, I I mean, there's some compelling stories in there that are tear jerkers. I've I've really gotten positive feedback on it. I loved it. I think I watched it a few days after the release. And Mm. what I so appreciate about your approach to this documentary is I didn't sense you trying to move one way or another. You let the information guide you to the next step. And that's what's so powerful to me about this. It's not like you came there with a preconceived plan to make this play out one way or another. Is that fair to say? It was. I realized I had to marry integrity with this and tell the truth wherever it went. Mm -hmm. And so when you're at that level, it's logically possible you look and there's no cases. And you've got to tell that story And so I tried to tell my story as transparently as I could and my my process as transparently as I could because I think that makes good film. And I I think people really easily can recognize propaganda. And I'm like, I don't want to do a Christian propaganda piece. Yeah, Those have been done and people don't like them and we don't know how to fix that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, telling the truth. And you did. And... To your point, my wife and I watched it, and I was I was in tears at the end. Mm. So powerful. I'm not going to tell anybody why, though. A couple other thoughts here. One of the takeaways from this whole process, you said, was keep going. Yeah. What kept you going? What type of, What type of prayers were you and your wife praying on a consistent basis? Well, God, you told me to do this, and you will provide. Like, I also in my heart knew I had one life and I don't want to come to the end of my life and the story I'm telling on my deathbed to whoever's listening is I was called to do this thing and it got hard and I stopped. Wow. And I think there is this power I learned in filmmaking of what story do you want to tell? And oftentimes when I 
am in potentially painful situations where the only way forward is to do something hard I don't want to do, I have to ask myself, well, what story do you want to tell? Do do you want to tell you had character? Do you want to tell you chickened out? And I think asking that question really helped a lot. That's a strong question to ask. And you also said one of the key takeaways was to sacrifice everything when God calls you to do it. How do you get into that mental and emotional space? I think you do it daily with the little sacrifices, building your character, being sanctified, being shaped into the image of Christ is about little things. And I think it's easy to fantasize, well, if I were in this really bad situation, I would make the right choice. Like yeah. if, if, if Muslims were coming through and saying, we're killing all the Christians, do you believe in Jesus? I, w- I would say yes. But what happens is if you don't develop the character in small things, you can't do it in the big. And that's what I saw my wife trying to do, especially, is she was pushing into, I am developing character through this, whether it goes well or not. And I think also making success not contingent upon the outcomes, but contingent upon did I live the way I wanted to live through this was super helpful. That's some deep stuff. But you know, as you share that, it resonates so much inside as a believer. That is truth. And I love that. Another takeaway you shared was you learned how to die to yourself and become who Jesus called you to be. Explain that. Well, I think one of the things that I experienced from my abuse was really wanted to be accepted and loved at the price of compromising my character. And I would try to be the life of the party or whatever. And I realized I had to die to that. And part of that is putting myself online in a space where the criticism is super harsh. If you're a religious podcaster Mostly religious people listen to you, but if you're talking to the secular space, you attract a lot of trolls sometimes. And my biggest heart wound is rejection. And to go, even if I'm rejected, that's a lie. I am loved by God, and I'm going to let that be enough and feel the pain. Like I, people tell you to develop thick skin. I don't know how to do that. (laughs) What I do know is how to obey with thin skin. Mm. And I think a lot of people need to learn that. So many good thoughts here that you've been sharing. I so appreciate it. Thank you. What's happening now as a result of the release of this movie? Do you have some other ideas that God is stirring inside of you for another uh, documentary? I'm pretty sure there will be a second sin proof. But I'm asking if there's a middle movie between the two. I, I'm really fascinated by science and religion stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you tell the mental issues that are legit brain issues like schizophrenia from the demonic? And is there evidence for that for the demonic is interesting to me. But I really want to wrestle with those hard philosophical and theological questions and scientific ones in my next film. And I'm just praying, God, what is the type of film that you want to do next? I can't think of a better person to do it than you. You've walked through this already. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. Please go to sendproof.com and pick up this documentary. You will definitely love it. And you're going to want to share it with your family and friends. As we finish up here, Elijah, could you please pray for our listeners? Yeah. And I'm going to just, I feel, encourage you before I pray. Everybody listening, your life matters. And God is inviting you to things outside of your comfort zone. And so I pray that you will accept that invitation and that you will believe Jesus that when you die to yourself, you will find life. And so I pray that God speeds up that process. I pray for those with PTSD. There is mercy for you. God is always merciful. He always meets us where we're at. He meets us in our fear and our anxiety. I pray for business owners that are struggling. I pray financial blessing 
And I pray that you know God during this time. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elijah, for being so vulnerable and sharing your heart on this. I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. And I hope we talk again. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.